Hey everyone, I'm Jeremy Saffron. and this is Kitco News. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button for the latest. Now this year, the gold market has been on a remarkable ride. Gold prices have hit record highs, driven by robust demand and significant purchases by central banks. Now in the first quarter of 2024, gold demand soared, marking the strongest start to a year since 2016. Now, central banks have been particularly active, using gold to diversify their reserves. Of course, this reflecting economic uncertainties and ongoing geopolitical uncertainties as well. Recent economic data also plays a crucial role here. April's headline CPI rose just 0.3% month over month, which was lower than expected. This, of course, boosting investors' confidence. Now, the key question now is whether interest rates will remain high for longer or if we'll start to see a rate cut soon. Lower rate cuts reduce the opportunity cost of holding gold, as gold does not yield interest, this making it more attractive to investors. And additionally, a weakened U.S. dollar with the DXY index dropping below 105 has further supported gold prices. When the dollar weakens, gold becomes cheaper for holders of other currencies, increasing demand. And then we look over to the emerging markets, especially BRICS countries, and they've also been increasing their gold reserve, signaling a strategic shift to diversify away from fiat currencies and to hedge against global economic instability. Now, today we're thrilled to have Joe Cavatoni. He's the market strategist for the Americas at the World Gold Council, and he joins us in studio here in Vancouver. Joe, welcome to the show. Thanks for being in here, man. Great to be here. I, I appreciate this. Uh, I'm excited because there's so much to get to. Let's first start with why you're in town. I mean, you've got beautiful weather on the West Coast, finally, coming from the CIM, the Canadian Institute of Mining Conference. Correct? That's right. That's right. I have uh, an opportunity to speak at the, at the event this week here in Vancouver. Aside from the wonderful weather, the, the event's been fantastic. I had an opportunity to walk the floor, see all the different displays of some of the traditional technologies, but even some of the newer technologies that the mining industry is talking about, and then feature on a panel with some really dynamic people and uh, present some of the things that the World Gold Council is doing, including our Gold Bar Integrity Program, which is kind of bringing technology and the industry forward in that regard. So really exciting conference, well attended, and happy to be out here. Yeah, I'm excited. I mean, there's so much to get into there. Uh, I want to stick to gold, but before we do, I'm just curious on the mining side. Is there any technologies that maybe you saw that got you really, really excited here? There's two, I think, that I want to highlight. The first is one that we're involved in, and that's actually using technology, blockchain technology, to track and trace gold from its source through the entire supply chain all the way out to the consumption side. Now, the LBMA and the World Gold Council are working on Gold Bar Integrity as a program, and we've both committed to working with Exedris, which is a platform that's going to bring mining companies, many of our members have signed, to put their gold onto it, but also all aspects of that industry onto a tracking and tracing technology. So really cool technology that's gonna help blockchain at the consumption level be more efficient mm. when it comes to understanding gold. And then the second is really a lot of technology that's around being smart about where they're targeting the digging and, and, and sourcing mine right. sites and, and using that kind of, uh, to, that, this, the ability to, to kind of say, say, this is the track of land that we need to get into and this is where we should be digging. So being more efficient around where they're digging. So lots of different technologies, but those are two that are really worth highlighting. Interesting, you know, it's always interesting for gold bugs because when we talk about the digitization of gold, you have some in the corner of excitement, right? We're gonna mature the industry. And then you have others that go, wait, I don't want anyone to know that I have gold. So how do you bridge the two in this industry? It's pretty simple stuff. And I think where we're spending a lot of the energy, rightfully so, is around tracking and tracing. I've used that expression a couple times, right. but I can't use it enough. Hmm. In order for access and efficiency at that access level to work, you need to know what you're getting your hands on and that you're getting it at a fair and reasonable price and that you can trust it. So when it comes to ESG standards, when it comes to movement of the gold, all of these things are enhanced by a, a clean, carefully crafted and efficient database, simply simplifying the ownership of gold at the source. And then ultimately it gets into the world of how and when do you use modern technologies to give better access. And there in the permissioned or the permissionless environments, we can have a debate on exactly what's the best way to get to gold. But this basic database will allow us to move the gold through the system, know where it's coming from, know the standards apply to it, and then ultimately get it into a world where you can now package it differently. Right. Whether it's known, telling people you own it, or actually not telling people that you own it, or however you want to deal with it, but it'll make these efficiencies come to life. 
and it's really an exciting opportunity. Yeah, that's fascinating. Okay, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about the gold market. I mean, what a year! I mean, we've seen, as I mentioned off the top, we've seen record highs. We've seen central banks demand through the roof. Talk to me a little bit about these emerging trends, what you're seeing, why we're here, what got us here. Give us a lay of the land. So we've had a couple of good years. So from a demand perspective, we have 22 and 23 being record-setting years for gold demand. First quarter, again, very, very strong first quarter demand. And a lot of what's happening is the consumption of gold in all the different areas that we regularly talk about are really shining and that use case is coming to life. You highlighted central banks, the case for central banks diversifying their reserve portfolio, right. adding an allocation of gold, increasing those allocations, 14 year trend and really picked up over the last five, particularly in the emerging markets, which I think we'll talk about. Mm -hmm. But secondly, the really interesting dynamic shift that's played out is kind of a pause by Western investors mm -hmm. and the Eastern investment taking off. So when you think about a market like China, where the central bank has been an active and the largest buyer of gold, it's also the consumer that's actually been moving not only from jewelry, but into investment gold. So we see increases in physical gold withdrawals from the Shanghai Gold Exchange. We see increases in the uses of the exchange traded fund products and overall demand increasing there. That'll probably slow a bit, right. but ultimately you're looking at an economic environment onshore in China that's gonna to continue to strengthen the case there. Throughout the rest of Asia and in the East, what we see are bar and coin demand levels still continuing to be very strong. So again, this dynamic of their homegrown economic situation causing for them to look at diversifiers into their own investment portfolios, really working to bring gold into the, into the fray. And then again, on the Western investor side, a pause, mm -hmm. a pause around holding my allocations, but not increasing just yet. Right. Okay, let's talk a little bit about that because obviously U.S. dollar is weakening. We're seeing gold demand go up. But is it really an East versus West kind of a story here? I mean, the West has paused because obviously we have meme stocks, all these trendy things that people can get involved in. But when it comes to the actual economic figures, are we seeing China mask anything here? I mean, they're not saying to their people, go pick up gold, but that's what's happening. So what's the telling picture here? The telling picture is that the driving factors that everybody wants to think are the only thing that move gold yeah. aren't. So if you think just about the dollar or just about US rates or those two together, it is a driving factor. We drive this point home a lot. Mm -hmm. You have to understand the global consumption and the localization of some of the demand trends that are playing out, in particular, that need for investor diversification in the East. And now it's not only just China, it's India, it's the rest of Southeast Asia, it's Turkey, but basically in the West, the driving factor for investor sentiment towards gold has been twofold. Number one, it will be rate driven in the US and the strength or weakness of the dollar, mm -hmm. but it's also a bit speculative. They're trying to get ahead of that move. So we might see some flows change and some push on the price, but then that quickly adjusts when we hear from the Fed and from Powell around that timeline to see that catalyst for when investor dollars will go back. Right. You mentioned exciting stocks around risk assets, mm -hmm. even lower risk type investments, higher sustained rates, more money on savings in your money fund. These are usually impediments to people allocating more to gold because you can get certainty around what your cash can earn for you. Right. Even with a weakening dollar, they're getting five, six percent on cash deposits. So that's holding them away from gold on the more strategic allocation side. But again, I think what's interesting, if you look at the ETF market, the actual value of the ETF holdings has increased with the price increase. The overall tonnage has been outflows, and that's what we've been seeing in terms of units redeemed. Right. But think about what's happening to an investor's portfolio. With the increase of price, you're still seeing a pretty level allocation as part of their overall portfolio holding. So they're holding, they're not dumping it in mass. And by the way, the last point to really highlight here, even with the West somewhat paused on an holding in gold, mm -hmm. it's not moving the price negative. It's actually not having an impact on the price. We're seeing the East drive the price more. Interesting, okay. Well, I mean, obviously you have a lot of insight into this. Sitting in a boardroom at the World Gold Council, you're looking to the future. You're trying to analyze what's gonna take place. What are some of these trends? I mean, talk to me about BRICS. Talk to me about the fact that these central banks are wanting to get away from the US fiat dollar and they want to start to have some skin in the game somewhere else that they feel is more secure. Did that start with Russia? Where did that start and, and where are we going? That's a 14 year trend. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's a 14 year trend. But I think what's played out over the last four to five has been a real emergence 
of central banks in the developing economies and the emerging markets. Right. So what you're seeing there is a perspective on the significance of U.S. dollar, U.S. dollar assets, the euro, and no real euro assets, mm -hmm. in those portfolios, and a need for these central banks to find that efficient, liquid shock absorber in their portfolio against risks that come with holding those assets. That, plus their own homegrown challenges around their economies, China as an example, right. Turkey as an example, where you can see factors at play, whether they're you know, real investment-driven issues around China or you know, systemic moments like an election outcome in Turkey where the central bank knows it needs to have that goal to hand. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's actually been a big driver of their behavior. But then lastly, if you look at the election year in the U.S. and the potential for outcome, the local politics, the local election, the playbooks that we've seen from both candidates, potential candidates, I should right, say, right. They're, they're looking like it's going to be a challenging environment for the U.S. to, to tackle down a lot of its fiscal issues. Mm -hmm. So its level of debt, its ability to sustain the, the debt levels. And I think that that's playing into the minds of these central bankers. So you know, we're, we're at the cusp of about releasing our, our, our annual survey. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more to come on the back of that. But over the last several years, what we have heard from them consistently has been a less of a reliance on the dollar, less of a reliance on the euro. Not because of geopolitical event risks like what's happened with Russia and Ukraine, mm -hmm. that's added surely to their decision. But ultimately, it's just a less of a reliance. And there's a good diversification benefit that comes from gold, particularly around its liquidity. They access it in the physical market. They're part of what's going on in that OTC flow that you see in our right. numbers. Right. Okay. Talk to me about the politics behind it. I mean, you know, we start to look into the United States going through an election. We start to look at their economy. Today we saw CPI numbers come in a little bit cooler than expected, meaning or at least hinting that possible rate cuts are on the horizon at some point. But how much of these economic data points are you looking at when you're looking at the gold market? Are you even paying attention to this or is it all pages out the window? It doesn't even make sense anymore. I think it does pay, that does make sense to pay attention to it, but I, I, I can't emphasize enough that gold is a global asset and the global factors that will drive its consumption and its behavior around the world matter more than just one individual component. Mm -hmm. You have to understand that. So we keep an eye on the rates in the US and we keep an eye on the Fed and the numbers, but like everybody, our crystal ball is not giving us an answer yeah. and we're not gonna wait for it. We understand and watch the other aspects and give people that data to make a better and educated decision on it. If you were waiting for a rate cut to see the price of gold move, then you would have missed a transaction. You would have missed a trade, right? And I think at this stage, it's an important element, but it isn't going to be the only element that's going to continue to move the price of gold. And I think more importantly, you know, we, we talked earlier about the fact that it's not going to be the only element that'll keep the price of gold where it is. Right. I think that these sustained sources of demand from other parts of the globe are keeping us at higher levels on average. First quarter, 2070 was the average price we saw over first quarter. That was a record high for gold on average over a quarter. Yeah. Now we're trending towards 23, 2400, but that level has been higher and we're higher to stay for a while because the case for central banks, the case for Eastern investors is still very strong. Mm -hmm. Might slow. Again, we'll have some seasonality to it all. Um, jewelry, another area where we're gonna see big demand, but it'll also slow with higher prices until people settle in on those. But again, I think that if you think about that, back to your original question around politics in the U.S., you know, it, it may have an impact, right. but I think it's going to have more of an impact outside of the U.S. because you're going to look at whether or not the U.S. is going to be able to handle its fiscal challenges, right? Um, short term, we've done a lot of analysis around the impact of an election outcome on gold. Short term, it might have impact for bar coin demand, but it doesn't have much of an impact on price. It's over time when election outcome leads to policy shift mm -hmm. that it'll over time impact policy and then foreign policy. And that's where you'll start to see the demand kick in on the back of an election outcome. Okay, so how divergent has the US dollar been to gold prices? I mean, has this been surprising? Or we're seeing, obviously, it's not really, it's not about the US dollar anymore, but typically- In, in, in its traditional fashion. Right. I think it's about the US dollar as a component on a more global scale. Right. But I think, again, it comes back to how does the dollar fit into diverse portfolios mm -hmm. on a global scale? Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, whether the dollar strengthens or weakens, again, an element of what's going to move the price. But at the end of the day, you need to understand that retail investors, institutional adoption of gold outside of the U.S., it's still very strong. And, and actually, 
Coming back to the Western investor, again, there hasn't been the wholesale unwind of gold investments that we may have seen in the past mm -hmm. with a streak weaker or stronger dollar. What you're seeing is people holding because, again, you have the strategic drivers of gold and then you have tactical drivers of gold. So when you have these moments of risk and, you know, every day I wake up and I see some piece of news that makes me think that there's something else on the horizon. Right. You know, we had a banking crisis. We had a conflict flare up in the Middle East, which is still not resolved. We had the Russian-Ukraine crisis. Those moments of shocks to portfolio, you want the kind of diversification you get with the gold in your uh, in your allocation. I think that that's going to keep gold as a component of portfolios. Again, on hold for an increase. But right now, I think it's staying firm in the portfolio. Okay. I also think correlations of bonds and equities, when we have higher, more sustained inflation, they tend to correlate more together. Right. And actually, that removes them as being the good diversifier in your portfolio. So that's where I think we're getting a lot of dialogue going with our investors and people are talking to us about it in that context. So on the U.S. dollar front, though, have you seen, because we have been seeing a decrease in that U.S. dollar, uh, have you been seeing other jurisdictions where the conversion rates are just crazy and gold prices are different, watching investors and consumers pile in and take advantage of this low dollar? Well, I think it, it's probably played out. I, I've said it a couple of times around the East. I think there might be more going to China than maybe we would have expected. Okay. I think that's probably what the case may be. And is it a really a, a dollar transaction or is it more of a renminbi transaction? I think it's probably more of a, what can I do with my renminbi without an ability to freely convert it and get it out of assets onshore? And I think that that's been more of a factor than, than, than what the US dollar is doing to some of these other foreign currencies. Hmm. I mean, we mentioned a little bit about the election year going into it. I mean, a lot of G7 nations going into an election year this year too. Uh, talk to me a little bit about BRICS. Talk to me about, you know, these countries coming together and trying to put U.S. behind. Is, this isn't a new trend. This has happened. But how important is it to be paying attention to things like this, uh, specifically on the policy side? I think it's an interesting concept that's been talked about. I think that uh, the BRICS community met. I think it was late last year. They talked about the fact that they were looking at a, a, a number of really creative and interesting ideas. And I just think practically speaking, it's not something that's gonna come to light yeah. anytime soon. Okay. And I think it's more than just BRICS. I think it's really looking at how the global economies come together and work together and the significance of the dollar and dollar payment systems. So when we hear this noise around BRICS displacing the dollar or alienating the dollar away from what they need to rely on, I, I don't think it's any more of a, an appropriate label than any other just perspective on saying, how does globalization play out? I, I really don't think it needs to be kind of categorized and say there's like this, you know, this weaponized kind of attack on the dollar. I think it's, it's, it's misleading in many ways. I think it makes for good headline. Yeah. But honestly speaking, I think the important thing to understand is look at a homegrown economy, look at how a central bank's dealing with what they're facing and challenged on that, whether it's part of BRICS or not. Mm -hmm. I think you can look at on a market like Turkey or Poland. I think you're looking at those countries and you're simply seeing cold consumption by those central banks, large consumption. You know, I, I don't think it's being driven by, uh, you know, uh, wanting to be a part of BRICS and wanting to peel away or, like I said, weaponize the dollar and move it away. Right. Um, so I, I, I'd say interesting, but I wouldn't necessarily put a package on it and say it's something that's going to displace the dollar for now. Right. Let's talk a little bit about the mining side, uh, because that's a conference you just came from. I'm curious, you know, you sit, we sit and talk to CEOs all the time. And as we discuss the divergence of these metal prices to the equity prices, they really haven't caught up. But I'm more curious about whether we're going to have a supply issue here. I mean, we haven't had a lot of capital coming into the mining side for a very long time to a point where people are worried. Is the World Gold Council concerned? I don't think we're worried, but what I would say is that actually um, the, the mining sector is taking great advantage of the prices that we're at right now. And I think that they're actually seeing that in terms of the level of production. Uh, I think we had a record first quarter in terms of the overall production that came through for 2024. So what I would say is that when you look out long term, there's definitely a need for us to continue to find new ways to bring more supply online. Uh, I think that 24 and 25 look to be very strong years for production. It's beyond 25 that we should be paying attention to how the capital that's in the system could meet through the new projects could actually bring more supply online. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important for us to kind of highlight the fact that that was a big discussion here at CIM mm -hmm. this week, which was talking about whether or not the right capital is coming to the industry or whether or not it's bringing it to 
um, the industry at the right in the right ways. Right. And, and I think there's a lot of work to do there. But right now, I think we look at the mining sector. I think there's a lot of good work that it's doing around uh, improving efficiency. The consolidation has been an obvious area of um, a lot of attention. But ultimately, 24 and 25, we could see record years yeah. in terms of the production. Beyond 25 there, that's where it starts to be um, you know, something we should keep an eye on. Right. When you, uh, let's go back there for a second. When you talk about the investment opportunities, are you referring to you know, funds coming in, a little bit more of the mature money, some institutional money, uh, that kind of thing? I mean, you know, we've had segments on our show about the Canadian pension plans not even getting involved in our own sector. So how do we influence this? How do we make it a little bit more approachable? This industry uh, has a lot of very exciting, uh, dynamic things that are happening. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I can highlight one around sourcing, tracking, and tracing gold from its site. That's amazing work, and that's actually a really exciting opportunity. What the industry needs to keep doing is promoting that information, getting that message out to say, this is not your sleepy old mining industry. This is an industry that's embraced ESG, that's actually working on consolidating those standards amongst a number of organizations, including our own, to bring the most wholesome ESG framework together for an industry that can cost efficiently run to these standards. They're using technology. There's technological advances in terms of mine exploration and, and, and mine, and mine um, the development. And I just feel like it needs to do a lot more of talking about how it fits into the value chain of something that ultimately gets onto a critical minerals list at mm -hmm. the end mm -hmm. or becomes vital to the way we all live. And I think that being part of the value chain as opposed to just the mining sector is a really powerful message for the mining industry to adopt, which is to simply say we're part of your lives. And I think that that was a big topic of discussion this week, which is how do we fit in? Yeah. How do we become part of the bigger discussion? And on the money side, I think it's interesting because you know, there's, there's a, a, a wealth of money that's floating around in a high rate environment. You know, it might be a little more challenging to get access to it, but I think this is an industry that's actually really an interesting one to watch about how technology meets mining, meets you know, vital, components of a, of a supply chain that's actually going to be right. pretty important for all the things that are on our desktop. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the grown-up uh, industry of gold. I mean, it doesn't seem as though it's just a hedge anymore. We've seen a lot of inflows from even investors into Bitcoin, understanding really what that means for them. I, I can see younger generations starting to hold gold. They're starting to buy, you know, gold ETFs. So has that helped? And give us your forecast this year. Where, where are we going? Is this sustainable? Yeah, so there's a couple of things to unpack there. Let me start by unpacking a little bit around uh, cryptocurrency in the Bitcoin right. space. You know, there's been a very high profile launch of exchange traded funds in the US. We attract, they, they attracted and we saw what we were expecting, which is a large inflow and kind of a bit of a stall in terms of the overall AUM at this point. That's really giving a certain community who may have already held it in one form or another, mm -hmm certainty around a regulated financial instrument. And so you're probably around 50 billion in terms of the AUM that's sitting in that right now. But again, it's actually concentrated amongst a few of the big players. It's actually expensive and uh, nothing's really changed fundamentally to the underlying asset. It's still very volatile, still a risk asset, but it's given people that better wrapper. Um, but what we're seeing with gold and what I think is actually quite interesting about where the landscape is right now. Again, I'm gonna reemphasize the fact that we have seen outflows in ETF, which is about 6% of the overall investment market worldwide. Bars and coins, investments in the East, still driving the value, a hold kind of a hold mentality on the West. So I think overall what you're gonna see is that a bit of a hold there until we start to see the opportunity cost improve for gold in the US in particular. And that's gonna be on the back of some form of movement on rates. Right. And I think, uh, or the rates sustain themselves for longer, so that higher inflation environment, which might move us back to a, a, that factor of driving investment dollars into gold. So, so we like the fact that the environment is ripe for consumption to improve in the Western markets. Uh, we see that the sustained case for gold in the East being very strong. Right. So that gives us comfort that these new higher levels that we're seeing look likely to be sustained. So um, our outlook for the year is continuing to be a strong level of demand from central banks. Uh, I think on the fabrication side, the jewelry side, with the higher prices, probably a little bit slower, a little bit less. Okay. Um, but Western investors and investment demand to remain high. And then overall in technology, which is something we really haven't touched upon, but with the introduction of more supercomputing, uh, AI, mm -hmm. different technologies coming online, we saw a big increase in demand, 10% increase in demand for the technology space right. in the first quarter of 24. So, 
a small component, but just uh, an interesting little corner of the market to keep an eye on. As it matures. Correct. Okay. Uh, talk to me a little bit before I let you go, just about if we start to see some of this economic data play out, you know, again, there's a lot of narrative. Are rates going to be cut? I, I was reporting on six of them back in January, for goodness sake. So there is a lot of narrative here, but if we cut through the noise, we see, you know, consumers buying, buying, buying at places like Costco. Yeah. If we start to see the economy do what it's meant to do here, nobody's going to be selling that off. Is this here to stay? Yeah, I think it is. I think that it's making a strong case for it. Look, I can't give good reasons for uh, a, a large sell-off in the gold price. I think ultimately what you have, again, if you look at the global demand and you look at the global mechanisms for which people consume gold, there's a strong case in each. And I think the concentrations that I think even others have talked about on your program around the reliance on China, yes, that's, that's a concern, but a slowdown is a more likely outcome than a wholesale unwind of gold. Remember, this is going to be slowing of demand versus unwinding of demand. Yeah. And I think that that continues to give us a strong case for the price to be supported. Joe Cavatoni from the World Gold Council. Of course, he's a senior market strategist for the Americas there, joining us in studio. Thanks again for coming in. We appreciate the time and thank you for watching. I'm Jeremy Saffron for all of us here at Kitco News. Don't forget to subscribe, like that video, and heck, even comment who you'd like to see on the show next. We'll see you next time. Thank you.